It is my pleasure to welcome <laughs> Pastor Yao Yao. It is a great honor to have the opportunity to come and join all of you today uh, for living uh, for living with power. And so this is going to be a really jam-packed session. I've got a lot of stuff that I want to get through, and so this is going to be a little bit more speedy. And so today I entitled this uh, Doing Good on Life's Worst and Best. And so I want to first start off by sharing you guys a story. So in 2004, I found myself in Iraq. And so in Iraq, we do daily missions in the city of Samara, Iraq. And so every day we would walk the streets uh, looking for the insurgents, and we would be in formation. And so every time we were walking down in the streets, the Iraqi children, they would come and see the American soldiers walking down the streets. Well, I stand out like a sore thumb because I'm about a foot sh shorter than most of the American soldiers. And so as we're walking down the street, the Iraqi children, they would look at all of us, American, American, American. And one day, this little boy, he came up to me and he says, you Jackie Chan! <laughs> You see, the only Asian that he had seen was in the movies, and that was Jackie Chan. And so to me, okay, that was just a really cool experience, having this relationship with the Iraqi children. And so they looked at me, they called me Jackie Chan for the entire year. And so in order for you guys to understand my story, I have to take you back in time, back to a different place. And so this is the sad story of the mom. Has anybody ever heard of Hmong land before? Okay? You guys, there is no such thing as Hmong land. There's Thai land for the Thai people, but when it comes to the Hmong, we do not have a country that we can call our own. The Hmong people, we basically are a homeless group of people. And so the Hmong people used to live with the Chinese, but the Hmong people were always a minority group, and so we were always persecuted by the majority. And so they, they, they wanted to eliminate the Hmong. They actually did such a great job that our written language was eliminated until the 1950s when the Western missionaries finally penetrated Southeast Asia, and they introduced the Roman numeral to the Hmong people, and we were able to start writing again. And so then, because of the persecution, we had to leave China, during the 1980s, uh, during the 1800s, and moved into Southeast Asia. And so Hmong people were just agrarians. We loved to farm, we loved to garden. All of that changed in 1965 with the beginning of the Vietnam War. So the Vietnam War, this was supposed to be a war that was supposed to take place in Vietnam, so there was not supposed to be any fighting in Laos. Laos was supposed to remain a neutral country, but what was happening was that the North Vietnamese communist soldiers they were going through the country of Laos to infiltrate South Vietnam so they can take that over. And so because of this, the American forces needed the support of the Hmong people. And so Hmong, the, the Americans came to recruit Hmong General Bang Pao. And so in 1861, there was an agreement that was made. The American CIA said that if the Hmong people were first willing to help, that if the war went bad, the Americans would help to bring, to bring the Hmong people to America. This became known as the secret war because the American CIA was never supposed to have gone into the country of Laos to involve an indigen indigen indigenous population of Hmong people to fight in the Vietnam War for the Americans. And so uh, several missions that the Hmong people did. So our main task was to basically stop the communist soldiers from using the Ho Chi Minh Trail because they would use those trails to infiltrate South uh, Vietnam. And then when the war first started, so this was just not a war that took place just for a few years. This was many, many years. And so in the beginning for the Hmong people, the men, the elders would be fighting in the war, but as the war continued to ravage on for many years, eventually they needed more uh, ethnic Hmong individuals to fight in the war. Children as young as 10 were then being recruited to fight against a professionally trained military. Uh, the second mission for the Hmong people was to rescue down American pilots. Again, American pilots cannot be in Laos. And so when they got shot down, there was the Hmong people that helped to rescue the downed American pilots. And then the other uh, task for the Hmong people was to protect the sensitive uh, military sites with military equipment. And so over 30,000 Hmong soldiers courageously died helping the Americans to fight off the communist aggression in the war. And so due to their sacrifice, 30,000 less body bags 
came back home to America. So if it wasn't for the Hmong people to first step up to protect the Americans, that would have meant 30,000 more Americans coming back home in body bags. So that was the sacrifice of the Hmong people. So then in 1973, the last troops pulled out of Vietnam. And so this was the beginning of the genocide uh, by the communist regime. No longer were our allies, the Americans, there. And so now we were basically at the mercy of the enemy with all the weapons that they have attacking innocent uh, women, children, grandmas, and grandpas. So then two years later, Americans kind of remembered their promise to rescue and help the Hmong people. So for two years, we were basically left in the hands of the enemy. And so for a few days, during May of 1975, the Americans came in and rescued about 5,000 Hmong people. That's really great, but the reality is there's just not 5,000 Hmong people. There are hundreds of thousands of Hmong people, most Hmong people in the Wasa community. We were the ones that were left behind. We were never rescued by the airplanes to come to America. And so the sad tragedy in America today is that there are still some pockets of Hmong people after all these uh, decades that are still left in these remote places still attacked by the communist regime. And so it is estimated that more than 100,000 Hmong fled to Thailand. It's estimated that 30,000 died trying to get into Thailand. The Hmong people knew that General Bang Pao, he flew into Thailand. Hmong people needed to follow General Bang Pao, and so we needed to escape to Thailand. And so while uh, this was happening, my parents also knew that they could not stay in Laos. They needed to get out. And so my parents, they actually had three children. So before I was born, I had three older siblings. From the point when my parents were trying to escape Laos until they finally got into Thailand, all three of my older siblings passed away. And so that's really difficult for me to sometimes just understand, is that I have three older siblings that I have never met. But one day, I do believe that I will be united with them again. When my mom was running through the jungles of Laos, she was actually pregnant with me. So if my mom would have been a statistic of that 30,000, I would not be here talking to all of you today. <coughs> So this was where I was born, Bob and I refugee camp. And so then that's a picture of uh, my mom and I in, uh, in that picture. My father was actually uh, absent during this picture because he also felt an obligation to, to go back and continue to, to be involved in the, the secret guerrilla warfare that was happening between the communist regime against the Hmong people. So then a few years later, my father came back and so then, um, in the 1950s, by the grace of God, uh, the gospel message finally penetrated Southeast Asia. And so Western missionaries finally came into these remote tribes, remote uh, jungle areas in Laos. Uh, our village was one of those that the gospel message was able to penetrate. So because of that, in my entire life, I have been blessed to have been raised in a Christian family. So we are among. We are a people that only knows war. That's the history of the Hmong people, basically warfare. And because of this, we came to the United States here today as refugees. And the, the sad reality is that we still hear it all the time in the community of individuals telling us, well, why don't the Hmong people just go back into uh, their own country? The reality is, one, we don't have a country. And the second reality is, this is not the war that we picked, but the Americans got us involved in that war. We're here today because we first helped. And so in 1987, our family was finally granted permission to come to the United States. So this was kind of like my photo ID to enter the United States. And so we lived in the city of Merrill. And so it was just a really scary experience for a young boy that's seven years old, basically living in a refugee camp my entire life. And then basically overnight coming to the most advanced country in the entire world, not knowing anything about this American society, not knowing anything about the language. For the first time in my life, it really freaked me out. I saw blonde hair and blue eyes. I had never seen that before. And so then it was just a really, really difficult time coming here. My parents were so poor that I had to walk a mile during the winter time from my house to school and back and not understand the entire language. 
And so that, that's a struggle of what it means to be a refugee in New York. So a year later, we moved to Wausau. And so school was a happy place for me because my teachers cared about me there. I enjoyed school because school took me away from the poverty of what I saw at, uh, at home. And so the, the really great thing about education is it's the great, great social equalizer. And so there I was able to feel like I could do something with my life. Because when I went home, this was my house. And so we lived upstairs. It was a duplex. And upstairs, there was nine of us living in a two bedroom upstairs duplex. My parents had one bedroom, and the rest of all of us kids, we got the other bedroom. And not only that, but it was also cockroach infested. So that's how I grew up. Basically, food from the Salvation Army, clothes from Goodwill, and so it was complete poverty. So my parents, every day, uh, my dad, every day, when he would send me to school, he would remind me, hey, Yao, you know how it really stinks to be living in poverty? You know how, how it feels to just struggle through life being so poor? I want you to know that working hard in school is going to help you escape poverty. And so I knew that, that for me, my ticket out of poverty was going to be my education. And so I worked really hard in school. Uh, during this time, my father was working at Kobe and Kobe. He made $25,000 a year supporting 11 months. That's a real challenge. And so that's how I grew up. During the summertime, I would hear it. All these American kids, they would be really excited because they're telling me about their stories about going up to their cabin in the North Woods, the vacation down to the Dells, to Disneyland, the sports camp that they get to go to. And for my family, it was survival. I needed to go and help my parents at the pickle farm. For many summers, we would pick pickles just so that we would have enough money to put food on the dinner table. And, and to me, growing up, that's been a really traumatic experience because I missed my childhood. I didn't get the joys of, of being a kid growing up in America. And so to make matters worse, before Christmas, I would hear a lot of chatter from the Caucasian students because at their house, there was this big Christmas tree. There were all these Christmas presents and I can relate to that. I could not relate to that because at my house, there was none of that stuff. All these kids are really excited for Christmas to come. But this Hmong boy, I didn't care about Christmas because I didn't know what Christmas meant. And so they talked about Christmas presents. And so then I asked my mom, Mom, are we going to be getting any Christmas presents for Christmas? And she said, we get nothing. We can't afford it. You don't get any Christmas presents. So all that finally changed when in school there was this angel. Her name was Ann Merrifield, and she was an ESL teacher for the Wausau School District. She was the one that taught me how to speak English. And so Ann was just this wonderful, kind lady. And so then uh, one day she said, hey, yeah, you guys don't get anything for Christmas, do you? And I said, no, we do not get anything for Christmas. And so she said, hey, come over to my house during Christmas, and let's just hang out. And so during Christmas Day, my father took our entire family, and we went to her house. And so for the first time in my life, I saw Christmas trees. I, I knew what that meant. I actually saw presents, and they were actually presents with my name on there. I got to open up my own Christmas present. And that was such a profound experience for me, seeing this Caucasian person who didn't even have to do these things, but yet she was willing to do that because she cared about giving this Hmong boy an American experience because that's what happens in America. And so because of her, I went fishing for the first time. Because of her, she took us to go camping. This is what great teachers do. They go the extra mile to make sure that their students know that they're cared for and they're loved. And it's because of all that that I have a great passion today for the great outdoors because she bestowed that love of the great outdoors upon me. And so, so what I learned from a very young age 
is that love sees no color. When you love, it doesn't matter if you're black, you're white, you're red, you're yellow. You just love because that's the right thing to do. A person's skin color does not matter whatsoever. So I grew up, and again, my escape out of poverty was being at school as much as I could. And so I was actually involved in a lot of athletics, which actually helped to pave the way for me when I entered the military. So then uh, another sad story for me is in high school. So I, I was an athlete in middle school. Uh, during my middle school year, I was the number one cross-country runner for the city. But when it came to high school, my parents kind of said, yeah, you're growing up now. You got to start uh, you know, buying things for yourself. There are things that you're going to, to want for yourself. We can't give those, those to you. And so my parents said, you got to choose school, like athletics, or working after school. And unfortunately, what ended up working was that uh, I had to basically work after school so that uh, I could provide for myself. And so the athletics that I used to love and do, I was the number one runner in Wausau. I took off a year so that I can start working. And then I realized that that was a, a big mistake. I came back and I was no longer the number one runner. And then after that, I, I wanted nothing to do with athletics anymore um, because I had to work to survive. So this is my life, only knowing poverty and always feeling like you're the underdog. That's like the worst feeling in the world. Just always know that you're just down and out, never having enough to get by. And so then uh, in spring of 2000, I graduated from Wausau West. And then uh, a month and a half later, uh, my wife and I, we got married. And so we dated for a month and a half. And I figured that if you're going to be the one that I'm going to marry, why should I spend more time dating you when I could just marry you and save a ton of money, right? <laughs> <laughs> so then I went to school that fall at UW Stevens Point, and so I, wa I wanted to go into television broadcasting because as a kid, I grew up watching and seeing Connie Chung, and Connie Chung was Asian. And I said, you know what? She seems pretty successful. I want to be like her when I grow up. And so I went to school to be Connie Chung. That's what I wanted to do. So then a year later, September 11th happened, and that event really just changed me. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, how dare these Middle Eastern terrorists come to the United States thinking that all Americans are bad and all Americans should just be killed, when growing up, I knew that there were good, loving, kind Americans and so I needed to do something to protect the freedom, the liberty of America, even though I knew that I was mum, because I realized the goodness and the love that's been given to me. So I'm kind of a dreamer, and so I just thought, well, you know what, Yao, you're just one person, but the reality is that maybe one person could also make a difference and change the world. And so um, because of this, I said, well, if I'm going to defend America, if I'm going to make America safer, that, that needs to happen in the front lines. So for this reason, I, I faced a lot of opposition, and I, I told my parents my desires to protect America. And they're like, no, don't do it. The reason why we left Laos and Thailand was to escape the war. And now what you want to do is possibly be entering into the war. And my mom said, I've already lost three children because of the war. I don't want to lose one more. And then when I was talking to my mom friends, they're like, yeah, don't do it. You're not even an American citizen. You see, I came over here as a legal resident. I was a refugee. I could legally live here, but I was not a full-fledged American citizen. And so they're like, yeah, don't fight the white man's war. Let them fight their own war because you're not even legally a part of this country. But in my heart, I realized that being American, it doesn't matter that there's a piece of paper that says you're an American citizen or not. My patriotism is what is based in my heart, and in my heart, I felt that this was the right American thing to do. Woo! And so, <laughs> and so because of this, I, I signed up as a non-citizen in 2002 with the Wisconsin Army National Guard. I figured that if we're gonna stop the enemy, there's only one job that's gonna allow me to do that. And so that needs to be a combat infantry soldier in the front lines. And so I was sent down to Fort Benning, Georgia in 2003, kind of as a side note. Um, 
I got my US citizenship in 2008. So after I came back, okay, so after I came back, I got my citizenship in 2008. So this was the most physically and mentally challenging time of my life for a little Hmong guy at 5'3", 130 pounds. And so um, it, it was a big physical challenge, but the reality was I had already made it in my mind and my heart that I was going to protect America. And the physical stature of, of me was not going to stop me from graduating from boot camp and serving America. Even though they were going to gas us, even though we had to qualify with weapon systems, even though they were going to do live fire exercises, exercises with bullets right on top of our head. Um, through all of that, uh, I was able to graduate. And during that time, I was the only crazy Hmong soldier that was willing to do that. So voluntarily, I didn't even have to. But I said, this is what I want to do for America. So then I came back to Wisconsin, and I'm like, yeah, this is really awesome. I get to be a weekend warrior for world, which is really awesome. And not only that, but I got the GI Bill. So I'm not as poor now because the government's kicking that in. And so life is good. And all that changed when Uncle Sam says, I've got different plans for you. What's going to happen to you is that we're going to give you an all-expense free paid trip to the country of Iraq. And so then we went uh, to Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2004 to 2005. I was stationed in Samara, Iraq, which was located an hour and a half north of Baghdad. And so that's where uh, Saddam Hussein, he was actually captured 15 minutes away from where we were living. And so we were known in, in, the, in the area, it was called the, the Delhi Sunni Triangle, because that was the one point where a lot of the insurgents were trying to take out the American forces. So then uh, one day, I was on OP position, and so it's an observation post, and so we were just, on, every day we would do 12 hours of just making sure that the enemy was not going to infiltrate our camp. And so we would start at 6 at night, at night, and we would be done at 6 o'clock in the morning, staying up all night. And so then one day, uh, I saw this truck with these children on there, and they actually started to come and clean one of the Iraqi uh, patrol bases that was there. And so, you know, I, I looked at these kids, and like that, that broom, that broom is taller than that kid, but yet yeah, he's out there having to do that. So then uh, I pulled one of the Iraqi soldiers over and I said, shouldn't these kids be in school? And they said, no, these Iraqi children are too poor. They can't afford to go to school, and so they have to pick up garbage every day for a living. So that's what they do to survive there. And uh, you know that just touched my heart because uh, I know what it means to struggle and to be poor and to not have enough. So then uh, everywhere that I went as an American soldier, I always carried some candy with me, uh, hoping that if the Iraqi children would come, I could make them happy by giving them some candy. And so that day, uh, you know what? Maybe just for a few minutes, as these children were eating candy, if I brought a smile to their face, I just felt that, you know what? That was my purpose, is to, to make that country more better and to help these children. So besides that, we would do a lot of missions, basically breaking in doors and kicking in doors, looking for the insurgents, looking for weapons. And so then uh, every day for an entire year, I woke up in Iraq and I basically said this, God, please bring me back to my bunk tonight. In Iraq, I lived one day at a time. That was the only way that you could survive. So every morning, I basically prayed to God and I said, hey God, all I need you to do for me today is just bring me back here tonight. And so these are all the different weapons and all the things that they would try to do to hurt and kill us Americans. So then when I joined the Wisconsin Army National Guard, I was attached with the, the Nielsville group. And so we were Charlie Company, one of the 128th Infantry of the 32nd uh, Infantry Brigade. And so that, uh, that's a picture of me right over there to the right. And then my squad leader was Staff Sergeant Todd Olson from Loyal, Wisconsin. And so then, uh, on December 26th of 2004, that should have been my death date, okay? And so, the um, city of Samar, Iraq is so dangerous because at night, the insurgents, they keep on putting uh, IEDs, the improvised explosive devices, uh, basically on roadsides, and sometimes we would walk by, we would drive by, 
and using a remote uh, detonation system, they would just uh, remotely detonate that, so we wouldn't even know that these IEDs or bombs are there, and they would only do that at night, because during the daytime we can see them, and so every night we would have to go walk or drive and patrol the city of Samar, Iraq, uh, making sure that the insurgents were not going to be doing that. And so this is, this is a picture that's taken with my night vision goggle. And so that's kind of what I see every night going out. So then if you can imagine this being at night, and so then during this time on December 26th, it was a pitch black dark night. And so I'm right next to that wall. So we're walking down and Staff Sergeant Todd Wilson, he's the number one man. There's another sergeant that's number two and number three from the front. And so we're walking down that white wall and I look at the wall and it says, have a Merry Christmas. For the first time in my life, I saw, I, I, I saw graffiti in English and that had never happened before. All the graffiti were always in Arabic. I couldn't read that, but this one was in English and it, had, and it said, have a Merry Christmas. So, so that Sergeant Todd Olson was right there. My second Sergeant was right there and I was right there. So between Staff Sergeant Todd Olson and myself, we were just a few yards apart. We're walking down the street, and all of a sudden, this huge white flash happens. It's like somebody just turned on the light. And then a half a second later, I felt the explosion of a huge bomb going off. The shock wave of that IED going off it felt like somebody took a sledgehammer to my belly. I felt like all my inner organs were just going to explode. The, the bomb was so loud that it actually ruptured my right eardrum. And when that happened, the first thought that came to my mind was, this is it. I was in a war situation. Sooner or later, the enemy was going to try to attack us and kill us. And it was during that exact moment where I knew that I needed to protect myself so that I could go back home. And so that IED blew off. Staff Sergeant Todd Olson, unfortunately, he was right next to that bomb. You see, the enemy, they were probably hundreds of yards away. They knew where their bomb was. They saw the shadows of the American soldiers getting close to that bomb. We got close enough, and they detonated that, killing Staff Sergeant Todd Olson. And so after that, we ended up calling QRF, Quick Reaction Force, they came to basically uh, take him in the Humvee and then to, to take him to a larger hospital. And so after they left, basically in the dark of night, we ran about a mile back, just terrified of that experience, not knowing where the enemy was. So we got back to our patrol base. And so again, this is at night. And when we got back, I asked one of the American soldiers and I said, hey, did you see the graffiti on that wall? And they're like, yeah, we saw that graffiti. And they said, did it just say, have a Merry Christmas? And they said, no, there's something more. I didn't finish reading it. The, the insurgents, they wrote, have a Merry Christmas and a miserable New Year. Blood, blood, blood. We were right by the wall where they said that. We didn't know that they had a bond that night. And so Staff Sergeant Todd Olson, he ended up passing away. So these are the craters, these are the aftermaths of these IEDs going off. And so, um, just such a scary experience. And so, you know, this event, it's called Leading with Power. And when I think of Staff Sergeant Todd Olson, I think of a man that led with power. And the reason why is because when you lead with power, sometimes you're scared on the inside, not knowing what's going to happen. Every night that we would leave base, we would not know what's going to happen. But our mission, our orders were to go and walk the streets looking for the insurgents. We never knew if we were going to be coming back. Inside of all of us, we were scared. But having the strength and courage to move forward on the outside. Nobody wants to talk about their fear on the inside, but when you're leading with power, you just go forward because that's the right thing to do. And so I'm alive today by the grace of God. If the insurgents, for example, if the insurgents, if they would have just waited a few more seconds, Staff Sergeant Todd Olson would have been past that bomb. I would have been next to that bomb. You see, by the grace of God, I was just saved by a few seconds. It's a miracle that I'm alive today. 
And so then, after that event, it really shook me up. And I asked myself, if I died that night, where am I going after? The reality was, I went to church, but just going to church, that doesn't save you. I kind of said, well, sometimes I, I read my Bible, but just going to read your Bible, it doesn't save you. And so in 2004, as a 24-year-old, I, I had to face my mortality, and I realized that if God was to take me home, I actually didn't know if I was going up or down. And so that really scared me as a 24-year-old not knowing my salvation. And so then I came to realize that there is no atheist in the foxhole. I now understand what they mean by that. Because when I thought about that night, there was nothing that any one of us could have done to change the events of that night. When his number was up, his number was up. I didn't want my number to be up. And so because of this, my faith in God was all that I had. God was the only one that was going to get me through this. There is nothing Yao can do to save himself. And so it's because of this that I basically had to surrender my entire life to God. I realized that God was going to be the only one that was going to get me out of this experience all in one piece. It's a very humbling experience when you think you're this big, macho soldier with all these weapons and you can do whatever. And you realize that you're basically at the mercy of God. And so I had to get down on my knees and I basically had to say, God, it's your will, not my will. But I would love it that I escape out of here all in one piece. So desperate times calls for desperate deals with God. I got really desperate. I wanted to come back home to my family. And so, basically, in desperation, I said, Hey, God, if you can get me out of Iraq alive, when I come back to Wausau, I'll do whatever you want me to do. By the end of 2005, I made it back home. My family started to grow. I got my teaching degree. In 2012, I actually got my master's also in educational leadership. I became a summer school principal back in my old elementary school. So I was the boss of my old teachers telling them kind of what to do. So that was kind of interesting. <laughs> So I came back from the war, I had PTSD, it was just really bad. Uh, I had a lot of survival guilt. Why did Todd die and why not me? And so that would play with my mind over and over again. I was a mental mess, I call it mental garbage. And so I brought lots of mental garbage back with me from the war. Um, and for us veterans, the reality is that my marriage suffered the most. And it's really sad, but we hurt those that we love the most. And so, in all of my trauma, and all of my, um, just the PTSD, I took it out on my wife the most. And uh, she, she basically wore a brunt of kind of uh, the atrocities that were going through my brain. So during really bad times in my life, uh, during times of depression, um, I would ask myself, why am I still alive? Why am I here? Because when I came back from the war, I was not a really good father. I was not a really good husband. And, you know, I said things and I did things that I wasn't really proud of. And because of this, it's like, God, why did you save me? What good has come out of this? I'm, I'm back home in America, and I'm not any better. In fact, I'm actually worse. And so then God pointed me to Genesis chapter 50 to 20, and it says, You intended to harm me, but God intended all for good. So that word, that word good, <coughs> stuck with me. All the things that I have put you through, y'all, Please know that that's all for good. And so because of this, you know, I thought, okay, well, you know, I've been a refugee, I've been in poverty, I've been in war. And so I have to, to have a new purpose to live. And because of this, God needed to give me a new purpose. I did not know my purpose for my existence anymore. You know, in Iraq, I knew what I did. I came back home and I felt worthless. Like, what's the point of me being alive? And so then in 2015, God reminded me of my promise to him 10, 10 years before to do something great for him. And so then uh, in 2015, two different pastors said, hey, have you ever considered church planting? And I said, well, that'd be really cool. So if I'm going to start a church, it's going to look and be different. You see, I was a Hmong guy who went to a Hmong church telling Hmong people about Jesus. I looked on the other side of the aisle. There were the whites going to the white church telling white people about Jesus. 
And I thought, you know, there's a problem with this. Because at school where I teach, I teach black kids, I teach Caucasian kids, I teach Hmong kids, I teach rich kids, I teach poor kids, and we all get along, but yet, the most segregated hour in Christian America is on Sunday morning. The most loving institution, the church is the most segregated. And so then I said, okay, that's really, really messed up because we're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations. And so then I started the cross January of 2016 uh, during uh, basically we had house church. And so then I made a multi-ethnic and non-denominational church. And so that's, that's who we are today. We're renting the YWCA. So then, um, you know, to me, leading with power in this experience is not knowing how God is going to use you, but trusting in him every step of the process. I didn't have a background in becoming a pastor. I didn't have any experience in church planting. I didn't have any of that. The only thing that I had was my faith in God. And sometimes leading with power means not knowing what's going to happen in the future, but trusting God every step of the way that he is going to be there for us, not to leave, uh, leave us. And so then I really thought about going to make disciples. What does it mean for a pastor to go and make disciples? What does it mean for a church to go and make disciples? And so then because of this, I started to go outside of the walls of the church. I started to go to the gazebo, to the bridges, to go and hang out with the homeless, to let them know that we care about them, to feed them. To go means to go and help those that are living out of their truck. And during the winter time, to stay warm, they would just turn on their car. And the least that I can do is put gas into their car so they can continue to stay warm for a few more nights. Going means to help those addicts who are struggling through their addiction with meth, alcohol, and all these things. Going means to meet those that are locked up at the Marathon County Jail so that on Wednesdays I can take another lady from my church so that we can go and let these ladies know that there is redemption found in the blood of Jesus Christ. And then on Fridays to do another Bible study. Going means to meet the inmates at Marathon County Jail and say, you know, when you get out of here, you need positive people at a positive place doing positive things. So then we take them to Bible study and they come and their lives start to be transformed because they start to see the love of Jesus Christ, not in the church, but us actually going out of the church to show the love of Christ to others. Uh, going also means to help people to find jobs. There are employers out there that will not hire sex felons, murderers, rapists, all these individuals. But through the Joseph Project, people come and we help them to be able to find employment. And so I wouldn't be able to help the downtrodden if I wasn't one of them. I realized, finally, why I had struggled through it in my entire life. I need to, to struggle through all of that so that I can relate and be empathetic to that 15% of the population here in Wassa that needs the resources and the help, but sometimes it's not there. And so, through hard work, if I can better myself, if I can go now and give a helping hand to those that need it, I understand their struggle. And so because of this, I really thought, what these people need, what the homeless, what the addicts, what the ex-prisoners need, what they need is a Christ-centered transitional living center. Sometimes they just need a place that's going to rescue them, that's going to help them that's going to find a place of recovery and respite just for a while so that they can get their self uh, picked back up. And it's because of this that there's a handful of us in this room that have joined together to say, we need to form a coalition that's going to come and help these people that are in need. And so several of us have been praying for a Christ-centered transitional living center here for Wausau. And so we're going to call this place the Gospel TLC. It is a transformational living center. And this place's mission, it's the gospel of Jesus transforming lives through the care of others. This is going to be a 6 to 12 months of sober recovery involving shelter, clothing, food, addiction recovery, spirituality, employment support, 
It is going to be a coalition of churches, Christians, businesses coming together and saying, we believe that for some people in this community that is in recovery, a part of that process involves Jesus Christ as a step in moving forward. So this is my story of tragedy, but making good come from that. Not everyone here today has a story involving war, bombs, and death. Some of you have been greatly blessed in your life to have never experienced these tragedies that I have gone through. This is not to say that you still can't do something good from God's many blessings. Think of Moses. God says, Moses, you're going to free the, the, uh, the Hebrews, the Israelites. And Moses said, God, like, I got nothing. And God's like, what do you got in your hand? God, I just got a staff. Well, use your staff. And through that, miracles are going to happen. And so when God says, hey, Yao, we need a multi-ethnic, non-denominational church here that understands homeless addicts and ex-prisoners, I ask God, God, how is this going to happen? And he says, what do you got? I just had a home. So we decided house church, and that's how it started. Okay? So here's the deal. Every Sunday I preach, and I say it's not good enough for you guys to just come here. Billy Graham says, the test of every preacher is that his congregation goes away saying not what a lovely sermon, but I will do something. I would have failed you today as a presenter if you walked away and said, that was just a really cool story about y'all's life. No, okay? I want you to take it to the next level. How can you apply today's message into your life? So I want to ask you this. What has God given to your life, whether it's the worst or the best, that today you can use that for the good of others? That's my challenge as you walk away today. Do the good and do the best. How can you help others with that? Okay? And that's the reason why my presentation today is doing good from life's worst and best. And so, Pastor Yao Yang, the cross, I would love to be able to, to connect with all of you. That's my cell phone number. That's my email. And so, thank you very much for your time today. God bless everyone here.